Hello, uh, once again, we are doing another Rahalas Tapa. This one comes from the Oxford Playhouse. My guest is George Mombio, the environmental campaigner and journalist, extremely intelligent man with dire warnings for your future. But some um, tips on how to avoid uh, calamity, hopefully, as well. Uh, it was a very interesting podcast. I hope you will enjoy it. Um, Come and see one of these if you like. Um, the uh, London gigs are starting up in March, on Mondays in March, April the 6th as well. Um, there may be a special gig on March 24th at the O2. <laughs> Little room. Uh, and uh, there's Birmingham and Norwich also coming up. Sorry if the light uh, ch- changed there on the video. I can't, I can't do anything about that. Um, go to richhane.com slash gigs you can find out where we'll be adding some more dates later in the year as well um, lots of cool stuff coming up Relativity in, in July on Radio 4 I'm back on uh, Point of Celebrities at some point There's some other things that uh, we'll talk about when I'm allowed to tell you about them and we are aiming to do a podcast sitcom as well this year which I have to get on with writing, but is very exciting, which hopefully we can fund with the adverts that you've been listening to on your Acast feed and so on. Uh, So that was worth doing in the end, wasn't it, if you get a whole new series of extra stuff. That's the way I look at it. Uh, And remember, if you become a monthly badger, you can hear these podcasts without any adverts in them. Go to gofasterstripe.com slash badgers. You get all kinds of other benefits as well. Come on, I've been talking for one minute, 46, 47, 48, 49 seconds, 50 seconds. It just goes on. The more I count, the longer it is. Let's see if we can get this going before we hit two minutes. Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy. Ra, ha, la, sta, pa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Oxford Playhouse. Please welcome a man who appeared on this stage in 1989 paying Bolshinsov in a month in the country. People are still talking about it to this day. I'm a person, it still counts. (laughs) It's Richard Herring. (laughs) Thank you very much. Bolshinsov, you remember me? You may remember me of my appearance as Bolshinsov. Oxford in uh, a month in the country. Uh, the weather today is, how should I say, very pleasurable. Um, that's one of the lines. That's my, that was my catchphrase. <laughs> Dave Allen came to see the show. Not because I was in it. I must have been friends with someone else. And he passed me on the stairs back there. I've just suddenly remembered. And he said, here come the heavies. That's what he said. They is, that's, so it's beautiful. Anyway, welcome. It's lovely to be back in Oxford. Uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Lost Swathes of Time podcast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Got to come keep it fresh. My podcast come up with a new idea. Uh, this one, I reflect on the 30 years it's been since I've been at university, since I left university, and feel tragically sad. Uh, literally, it's going to be just an hour of me just crying. I was <laughs> sitting in pret a which I thought it used to be wimpy, but it wasn't. It used to be Laura Ashley, so it's okay. But uh, and just there was a couple of really nerdy first-year students in there who looked about 12, <laughs> talking about orienteering. <laughs> and uh, yeah I thought that's why I didn't have sex until I was 20 <laughs> but I was hanging out with uh, the Bullingdon Club uh, <laughs> there were three future PMs smashing up restaurants and being rude to and afraid of women uh, and one of the homeless people we burned 50 pound notes in front of said he calls it Rahulastapa so I did <laughs> And uh, he was disappointed with me for, for behaving in this way. Uh, lucky you didn't see me fucking that pig's head, wouldn't it? So, um, I actually did genuinely invite David Cameron on as a guest for tonight's show, but they declined for some reason. <laughs> Can't imagine. Can't imagine why uh, that would be. So, uh, it is lovely to be here, uh, back in Oxford, back on the Playhouse. I've been here a few times, but since... Uh, I did perform here as a student, right next door to the Burton Taylor rooms, where I remember... Back in about 1987, I did an amazing fart just in the foyer, in the staircase. 
that were so bad I had to run into the toilets and hide. Seriously, just waft. Everyone was queuing to go in. And it just, it was a, I was eating a lot of beans at the time. I was vegetarian. Don't let anyone tell you that helps the environment. It does. That's worse. It's worse. Uh, apologies for not blowing up the Oxford Union in the 1980s when I had a chance. That's, that's, uh, it's been lovely to be back here. Um, uh, I was, uh, I passed, but I could, could see Boswell's is still here. And though it's slightly smaller than it used to be. Waterstones has taken over the bit where I shoplifted Creature Comforts from the... <laughs> Uh, and uh, we used to, Stuart Lee used to do a joke because there can't be a god because if there was one you'd be able to buy him in Boswell so that was <laughs> can't do that anywhere else but here I don't think you'll mind me doing that uh, yeah what else have we got uh, yeah I'm doing uh, uh, well, I just was remembering the Carfax chippy that I used to spend a lot, is that still there? Everything's changed. That's good to see that. I spent most nights going out trying to find some girls to talk to with my friend Mike Cosgrave, but we just ended up playing the fruit machine uh, in the Carfax Chippy, eating chips. It's amazing times. Uh, I, did, I did lose my virginity in Oxford, so thank you for that. Oxford <laughs> took a little while. I wasn't quite 20. I was, I don't know, I was nearly 20. And looking at those boys now, I'm thinking, the girl who had sex with me was a paedophile. That is disgusting. <laughs> She used me. <laughs> it was a t I had sex once for about 50 seconds. I didn't come, mate. Don't know. It wasn't because I just stopped because I was scared. Uh, and then I uh, didn't have sex again for another year. So, you know, you know one. Not going to accuse me of not being a stud. Uh, do I have anything to tell you about Oxford? Maybe, maybe next week I'll tell you more. <laughs> if, you come back, if you can come back next week, it's very different. Very different time. Right, look, let's crack on because... Uh, Got a fantastic show for you tonight. Uh, please welcome my guest this week. is probably best known for um, for his failure to save a woodpecker when he was eight years old. <laughs> Will you please welcome George Monbiot, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. Come in. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Here we go. All right. Thank you very much. Well, if I'd known I was second choice to David Cameron... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no you, were, you, were, you were in first. So it's Paul Sinner, who yeah. isn't here, who oh, was right. uh, okay. second choice to David Cameron. Does he know? Did you tell him? No, he doesn't know, but I'll, I'll yeah. definitely rub it in. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I didn't think I'd get David Cameron, so... <laughs> As in Liverpool, I tried to get Paul McCartney, so I don't, you know... <laughs> and did I get... No, I didn't get... Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he lives there anymore. Um, well, you do live here still in Oxford. Yeah, again. Yes, you yeah. come back. Yeah, you come back. Yes. God knows why. Because <laughs> <laughs> you didn't enjoy, you were a student here, but yeah. you didn't particularly enjoy being a student here from what I've read. No, it, it was, I, I, I just sort of started on the wrong foot. You know, I thought I had to behave as stupidly as everybody else around me and it just didn't work and I... I just kept falling flat on my face, mostly in a drunken stupor, and yes. I eventually decided that this was just shit. It just <laughs> didn't work for me at all. And right. so I then became a recluse throughout my whole second year, which is, you know, not great for all the networking you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and then and, and I just decided I, the only thing I wanted to do was to plan what I was going to do after, because right. I just hated it from that point. It is difficult, but I didn't enjoy it at all either. And I think it's because it's so overwhelming... Um, once, I, once I sort of got into just doing comedy and acting, I enjoyed that part of it, but the rest of it I found, you know, I was literally just walking the streets eating chips. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's what, of women. It, it's almost like you're sort of overwhelmed with... I mean, for a start, you know, you, you're supposed to be drawing attention to yourself. That, that you know, sort of later on I realised that's what Oxford is supposed to be all about, you know, being a student here. You're supposed to be drawing attention to yourself. And if you're really crap at it, uh, and you do it in all the wrong ways, and all you do, obviously, is make a massive plonker of yourself <laughs> um, in front of all these people who are later going to become really influential. Yes. And, and so you then think, oh, God, what have I done? You know, and then, then you hide yourself under a rock for the rest of the time. You didn't put your cock in a pig's mouth, though, did you? No. I mean, I hope. No, well, there was someone standing there already. <laughs> <laughs> There's another who could have come in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Still leads to the same place. Tell us about this. So the, your activism started as an eight-year-old trying to save a tree being cut yeah, down? Yeah, so, so I, I was brought up not all that far from here. I don't know why I never managed to get away. Um, and um, 
there was this common close to where I lived with this beautiful old hollow tree, cherry tree on it, which had a green woodpecker's nest in. And I was wandering about, as, as I usually did when I was eight, um, on the common, and this guy turned up with a chainsaw to cut the tree down because he had firewood rights and he could cut down any dead tree, which actually is the last trees you should ever cut down because there's more life in a dead tree than in a living tree. And, and so he turned up with obvious intent, and I just clung on to the tree. I was like the, the earliest tree hugger in, in, in history, and, and, I, and, and, and I refused to let him cut it down. Unfortunately, I was a very obedient boy, and the, the one condition of being allowed to wander freely over this common all day long was that I came home for lunch. <laughs> and I learned a really important lesson that day. <laughs> Yes, they don't. You, you can make them promise, but they won't. You, you'd have to get more than promises out of people. Yeah, well, please and, don't cut down three. Yeah, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, and there has to be more than one of you. That it was another yes. quite important lesson, especially yeah. when you're eight. And don't have lunch. Don't have lunch. No. So there's never have lunch. Not, well, I'm glad you're here because there was a uh, there was a possibility that you would not make it because you were trying to get arrested this month, mm. and I worried that that might lead to you being in prison. Mm. Well, well, I, I wasn't. Uh, that was the the intention. Yes. Yeah. So it, it would have been a, a failure if <laughs> if I hadn't ended up at yeah. least in a police cell. I would have been in my diary for six weeks. Um, <laughs> that, that on that day I was going to get arrested because you know when you've got a busy life you have to plan these things. <laughs> um, and and the weird thing was, so I got arrested under under two things. They haven't turned into charges yet because there were so many of us getting arrested. This was with Extinction Rebellion that they had to kick us out of the police stations before they charged us. So I've been released under investigation. But one of the things I was picked up for was breaching this Section 14 order, which the police had imposed, this blanket ban on all protests across London. Now, it happened that I was already one of the um, claimants in this judicial review against that section, Section 14 order, which is this... It's just a sort of direct infringement on our human right to protest. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and and a couple of days after my arrest, the lawyer who was in charge of this judicial review rang up and said, um, so, right, we had to go through your standing in this case. And, and he, he said, right, so, you, you know, you've been an activist and all this for a long time, great. And, and, and what else? I said, well, I did get arrested under Section 14 a couple of days ago. Great! That <laughs> enhances your status before the court. I thought, maybe I should pull off a bank robbery or something. You know, I'll be right at the heart of the establishment. As they, the courts love murderers who've done it before. Go, oh, well, he's done loads of these. Yeah. He's brilliant. <laughs> I have to give him some respect when he turns up. <laughs> um, so, so you got, you'll we'll hear later. You'll get you'll get called in later to be taken to court. Mm. Well, uh, I, I'm, I guess so. I mean, well, they're, they're, I mean, part of part of what we were trying to do was just to overwhelm the system. And yeah, um, yeah mission accomplished. You know, they, and what's the thinking um, behind that? Why why do you think that will help? Well, so. The people who organised Extinction Rebellion had done this massive research into successful rebellions, civil disobedience in the past. And they found out that non-violent protest is much more effective than violent protest. You know, they, they really did this thoroughly and empirically. Um, that massive social transformation, like civil rights, decolonization, votes for women, democracy movements in East Germany and Poland and the rest of it, succeeds when large numbers of people show that they're prepared to lose their liberty over what they're trying to achieve because then other people take them more seriously right and so the idea was to get as many people arrested as possible in the hope that other people would take us more seriously yeah um and and i think some people did uh, the police did <laughs> <laughs> but um and no i mean it did work i mean it has been successful in that it's pushed the issue right to, to the front of people's minds where it ought to be, as opposed to in that annex down behind the back of the building where we can safely forget humankind's greatest existential crisis that we've ever faced, which is how the media and politics have been treating it up till now. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so it, it succeeded thus far, but you know, declaring climate emergencies and all the other things they've said doesn't actually get us to where we need to be, which is... Um, preventing this, the gathering collapse of our life support systems. Yeah. Gone quite heavy quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Will we get you, to the end of the you, interview okay? Or you invite me on to a comedy show. <laughs> 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 it's okay. We're allowed to. Allowed You've to only serious. got yourself to blame. <laughs> it's all right, because the more you build up seriousness, the more I can undercut it with jokes. So oh, I'm good. very yeah. I'm very happy. Is this, this is my perfect... Is, uh, is this where the ritual humiliation begins? <laughs> it is. Well, I'm not... No, well, do you think... How do you think it's working? Because I think it's sort of... I, obviously, the media... With the latest, uh, back in, we're, we're talking back in October uh, 2019, for those of you at home, uh, with the latest load of protests, the, the, the thing that sort of captured the media's attention and maybe Twitter's attention was the guys climbing up on the tube and mm. disrupting regular people's days, commute into work and then being dragged off the tube and kicked and everyone found that quite amusing, it seemed. Yeah, it and was. So, which also seems to go against your point of peaceful protest. It wasn't XR's greatest hit. No. I think from, from the distance of the future in which this podcast will be heard, yep. <laughs> looking back on October 2019, it will have receded somewhat into the background and sure. people will be talking about more significant things. But, but I mean, what, what happened was that a few guys went off on one, basically, because pretty well the whole of Extinction Rebellion has said, we do not want to do this. This is a really daft thing to do. Yeah, apart from anything else... Electric mass transit, that's, yeah. what, that's what we want. Yes. And so you're going to go and stop it? <laughs> Why? You know, it's just, it just, none of it made any sense. And then, and of course, it, well, well so, so <laughs> I, I, I'd been, I'd been um, taken to Lewisham, Lewisham Nick, because that was the, the, the closest place they could find a police cell to put me in, because so many of us were being arrested. Some people were being taken, I was arrested in Whitehall. Right. I was taken to Lewisham. Some people were taken to Brighton. The following morning, following morning, I, I had to take the Eurostar to Brussels to, to give a lecture to the European Commission. I mean, this is a sort of surreality of my life, from a police cell in Lewisham to, to talking, talking in the, this vast European Commission monolith. And I very nearly missed the Eurostar because some assholes had blocked them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but do you, I mean, I, I, obviously all protest movements have, have gone through these various things and obviously they annoyed people. The suffragettes annoyed quite a lot of people. Why did they have to ruin that horse race? Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, it is, it, it obviously is such a crucial issue. Why do you think people are not, I mean, do you, think, do you think people are engaging with it more, but why have they not engaged with it faster than this, do you think? Well, it's, 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 it's a really good question. I mean, it is the big question, really, because, you know, I've been banging on... I mean, it's been 34 years now. I've been banging on about almost nothing else, and I've beaten my head against that wall so hard that the bricks have come out. Head's fine. It's, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's been so frustrating this whole time. Um, I say, look, look, this is, this is it. This is life or death. This is everything. This is the biggest thing humankind has ever faced because it is our life support systems. It is the only habitable planet we know and we're making it uninhabitable. And, and you know, I've argued it every which way and I'm, no, I'm not the only one. There's thousands of us have been doing this and we just haven't been getting any headway at all because it just contradicts everything. What it says is that everything we regard as progress is progress towards the cliff. You know, we think, oh, economic growth, great. You know, we've got to have more economic growth. Every government on earth is trying to stimulate economic growth. But given that we've never managed to decouple material, the use of materials from economic growth, what that means is growth towards disaster. It's the growth of the cancer cell. It's just, it, and, and so you have, to, you have to say, right, well, we're going to challenge economic growth. Oh, shit, if we challenge that, we have to challenge capitalism because you can't have capitalism without economic growth. Growth is a compound of, of profit that, 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 that people are pursuing. And so then you say, all oh, right, so we have to challenge the whole political and economic structure, which is built around capitalism. And you end up challenging everything. And by and large, people aren't prepared to do that. <laughs> Certainly not in the billionaire press. No. Um, and so, so you end up with, you know, just, you know, the arse gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But it has to be. It yeah. has to be big. I mean, basically, capitalism is not compatible with the survival of humanity. And I come to that reluctantly. You know, I didn't start off as an anti-capitalist, but I became one when I saw that it doesn't work mathematically. Yeah. 
and and so you know you you you're swimming against the flow of consumerism which is our dominant ideology no one even recognizes it as an ideology because it's a plastic soup in which we swim um, you're swimming against the flow of the entire structure of power and most importantly I think you're swimming against the media you know you, to own a newspaper you have to be a billionaire do billionaires want to see the end of capitalism do they want to see their activities restrained do they want to be told they can't do certain things because it's going to cause everybody else to die no because they're going to be the ones in the security condominium on, on that <laughs> island in the middle of the Pacific going, ha, 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 while everybody else goes under the waves. But cap if the world ends, capitalism will end anyway. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's, part, it's on the world, right? <laughs> we'll have capitalism in space. Well, but I well, mean, you need, no, but you no, need no, people. No, no, for check this. I mean, so there's a whole field of, of like environmental economics, which is completely insane, which basically says... Uh, it's all fine. We can keep growing and growing and growing and causing more and more climate breakdown and environmental breakdown because economic growth will more than compensate for it. And, and the guy who basically kicked all this off, William Nordhaus, he got the Nobel Prize in economics last year. And some of us have been looking at what happens at certain amounts of temperature rise. So like by six degrees, he reckons there'll be six degrees of global heating. Um, we will have... Uh, something like 2 to 5% less economic activity than there would otherwise have been, which is still more than the big. Six degrees is pretty well the end of human life on Earth. <laughs> you have to get to 19 degrees until they accept there'd be a halving of economic activity. <laughs> now, 19 degrees is probably enough to trigger the runaway um, global warming feedback, which ends up with an atmosphere like Venus, <laughs> where there is... Not even bacteria can live in Venus. But it's fine because we still have half the economic activity that we have to take. But it just, you know, that's what I guess is hard to understand why the people in charge, even if they want the money now, that they're not thinking ahead. I mean, it, the evidence seems... I know Donald Trump sort of it seems to be sending everything backwards, but the evidence seems to be pretty clear, or pretty much all the scientists agree with what you're saying about, about what will happen with global warming at least so so yeah so the choice they're faced with is power and wealth and dominance now or versus complete collapse when after they've died versus stepping back and letting some other people have a go and yeah. distributing the wealth a bit more and the power a bit more with the continuation of life on earth how is that in any way a choice for them yeah <laughs> you know, I mean, they just don't think like that. They no. really don't. You know, those, those who exercise power today exercise power because that's what they want to do. And those who accumulate vast amounts of wealth to do, today, that's what they want to do. Yeah. That's what they're in it for. They're not in it for anybody else. They couldn't give a stuff about anybody else. That's a terrifying realisation. You know, when you're in my business, yeah. that's a terrifying realisation that you come to that they could not give a flying shit what happens to you, to me, or to anyone in this audience. Yeah. But they're still on the planet. That's the problem. They're still there. Do you think people just... I mean, because, you know, uh, me as a human being, um, I mean, I used to do a routine about leaving my TV on standby and, uh, you know, and the difficulty of getting up out of your seat and walking and pressing a button like in Victorian times and having to walk back <laughs> to your seat. Uh, and... Uh, and the, you know, in 50 it's like years. kids being sent down the mine. <laughs> it is. It's terrible. But you know, I still, did, I still don't do that. You know, I know it's that's not the big thing. But the, but 50, 60 million people, four billion people doing that obviously makes a difference. And you know, in fifty years' time, everyone's living underwater. Going, you know, you, 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 if you just turned the TVs off, that would have made a difference. You must have known what would happen. Yeah, we did know. But yeah, but it was really hard. Yeah, to we get did. Off we sofa, did. Yeah. You have to imagine it from our point of view. It's the walking. <laughs> So, you know, I know, you know, I'm still concerned about it, but, uh, you know, we're not making... I don't, we're, people aren't making changes, just the public aren't changing. We're still flying everywhere. And is that the main... Is well, flying the main problem? Is that... Is... Well, flying, flying's the biggest thing you can individually do. Yeah. In, in, if you really want to cook the planet, that is the biggest thing you can do. But, but the, the basic problem is that, you know, consumerism is a problem. We can't consume our way out of this. I mean, no. there's no such thing as green consumerism. There's just less consumerism 
And all the emphasis has been on, oh, you've got to change your cotton buds. Change your cotton buds and you, you'll, you'll save the world. You know, have those ones with the paper sticks, you know? Yeah. And that is, that's, that's it. That's, you've sorted it all out. <laughs> you know, don't buy so many plastic bags. You've changed it. No, we need systemic change. Yeah. Structural change. And, and it's not something that anyone can do individually. You know, even, you know, the, the th the, you can make some differences, like flying a lot less, plant-based diet, cycling, not not driving a car everywhere, whatever it might be, you can, you can do that. But unless everybody's doing that, you're just creating more space for other people to occupy. Yeah. You know, if, if, if I'm riding my bike, instead of driving the car I would otherwise be driving, some other, other fucker is going to be driving this massive 4x4 four <laughs> four in that space which I would have occupied. Yeah. And so, so you can't create that structural change alone. You've, you've got to do it through protest movements, through political change. Yeah. Because it, it, otherwise it can't happen. That's why I got arrested for Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, okay. Do you think people just believe, I mean, I just, I mean, the politicians and the public just have this feeling, I mean, is it, maybe it comes from religion or just from, they see people just think, with all these things that are going, oh, it'll be all right, everything will be, you know, someone will work out, my sort of theory is, someone will work out a way to, you know, make, car, make up more oxygen or whatever, less carbon dioxide, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> some scientists will make a, th a, th a thing that does that. So do you think people just have this sort of belief that someone will step in and, you know, some, a god will stop in and, and stop it? Or well, it's the way all the movies it. end, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and there, is this, there is this, I mean, it's a religious belief yeah. that it'll be all right in the end. Yeah. Uh, you know, people like you have, it'll be all right on the night. Yeah. <laughs> and then look what happens. But, 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 we, but, but there, is, there is that sort of, you know, we, it's almost hardwired that yeah. some there's going to be some higher authority, it's God or the government or something is going to yeah. sort it out, and it's going to be okay. But it's not. No, you know, I don't know if we can trust God because he's tr tried to destroy us loads of times, hasn't he? Yeah. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah for a start. Yeah, they I'm were not. only wanking and bumming. It's not that bad. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> not that bad. And on Noah's Ark, he took out, he took us all out for that. <laughs> it's awful. Not even clear. <laughs> it's not even clear what we actually did. <laughs> no. It's very, he's a very confused person, yeah. God. That's my problem. With, yeah. I think he's enjoying us all yeah. heating up. I think he likes it. Um, let's talk a little bit. It's, we'll come back to it, I'm sure. Uh, and there's loads more to talk to you about. Let's talk a little bit about you, because I'm sort of fascinated by your... Uh, well, your, your, your whole kind of journey to this point. I mean, obviously, you started very uh, tuned in as a kid, and... Um, uh, but you, you sort of went into investigative journalism quite quickly. So you came, came out of college and went into the natural history unit at, in Bristol, is that right, as a producer? So, so I, I basically just spent the last year and a half at university just hammering on their doors saying, look, I want to make investigative environmental programmes. You're not making them. Nobody, nobody in the world is making them at the moment. And yet it's so obvious that they need to be made. And eventually I got a call to say... You're so fucking persistent, it is easier <laughs> to give you the job than not to. That, that's the exact words that yeah. the, the head of the Natural History Unit used. <laughs> and so, and, and, and it worked really well. I mean, it, you know, we did, I did it for about two and a half years. We cracked some massive stories. You know, we won awards. We got national, international coverage of some of the stories and stuff. It was fantastic. You know, went, and I thought, right, this is me. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Then... 1987, Thatcher launched her coup against the BBC because it had um, it done these incredible exposés. There was one called Maggie's Militant Tendency, showing that about half the cabinet were fascists when they were at university. Right. They were literally or, or members of fascist organisations. There was another one called Secret Society, showing all this uh, unauthorised spending the government had been doing without parliamentary approval and all these spy satellites and stuff like this. And... Um, and she just said, right, we're going to wipe out the BBC, which they more or less did. They forced the Director General, Alistair Milne, to resign, um, cleared out the board. And the, the day after his resignation, my, my boss came in and said, that's it, we've had it from the top, no more investigative programmes. Right. I said, what, you mean the whole BBC? He said, yep, that's it. And, and that's the point, I just had to leave. You know, there wasn't yeah. any future in that for me. And, and it was, it's never recovered. You know, the BBC, it was, it's hard to believe now that it was a really full-on, exciting place to work where you were just going to get them. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we got, we exposed some really dirty stuff. And, and now, you know, you, you, you know, it won't even say, 
uh, we're not having that Farage bastard on our programs. You know, it's like because we've got to get balance. Yeah. So you know, we've got to have some far right lunatic on in order to balance people who aren't far right lunatics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we've got to have him on thirty three times on Question Time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, that's what it's become. It's it's this overcompensation. Yeah, where, it's, where a, it's, it's a misunderstanding of balance as well because balance isn't just taking two people from the extremes. And, you know, if, if there's lots of people in the middle, then balance is taking people from the middle and occasionally going down to the, to the extremes. But, you know, that, it is, it's obviously that. I think Farage being on TV so much has clearly been an influence, hasn't it, on what's, <laughs> what he's managed to... Well done to him, he's done very well <laughs> uh, from his perspective. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I remember when Trump was elected and people said, oh, it's the first reality TV president. And I think, no, I, they're all reality TV stars, except in this country... The reality TV is Question Time, yeah. and it's and it's Newsnight, and it's a, uh, and 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 it's you know news at ten because the the l noisier you are, which basically means the crazier you are, the more airtime you're going to get because yeah. the whole competition is for noise. So you know you get someone making a complete tit of themselves, like Marc Francois tearing up that letter. Do you remember saying, "Oh, my father was." he didn't fight in two world wars I admit but, you know <laughs> yeah. and goes on and tears up this letter because there's some German bloke involved and and and, and you think god what a total idiot <laughs> whereupon the very next day his phone is ringing off the hook yeah. with the bookers for various programs and he's never been off the air since then that's what they want they want people who are going to create noise they want people where everybody's going to say I can't believe that tit is on the TV again <laughs> Mission accomplished. Everyone's yeah. talking about it. So maybe Extinction Rebellion should be more tittish. <laughs> I mean, they've been quite tittish at times, but maybe that's the way through. And so you we went. Well, I'm really, I'm interested in like if you look at your Wikipedia page, and I've, tried, I've, been, I've you can find other stuff, but it just sort of skirts through the various adventures you had as you went to, into investigative journalism, sort of outside of the BBC, I guess. Uh, you went to. You were sentenced to life in prison in absentia in Indonesia. What did yeah, you, what I was did you quite do? glad. Quite glad to be out of the country yeah. at that point. <laughs> what had um, you done to upset so, Indonesia? So this, it, it was quite easy to upset Indonesia at the yeah. time because um, so so I'd, I'd left the BBC yeah. um, and but I was on to this massive story which no one else was covering, which was basically this um, transmigration of hundreds of thousands of people um, being uh, sort of sometimes voluntarily, sometimes being coerced into migrating away from Java and Bali, the inner islands of Indonesia, out to these sort of wild parts, of the far-flung parts of the archipelago. And the ostensible reason was to relieve population pressure. But the real reason was to basically securitize the whole of Indonesia and turn it into one place with one culture, one language. And this was like about the most diverse, well, it was the most diverse place on earth. Mm. Still is to some extent. And, uh, you know, with an incredible number of peoples, astonishing number of languages. I mean, literally a couple of thousand languages and all these amazing different ecosystems. And they just wanted to trash the whole archipelago and turn it into sort of one sort of city-state, effectively, controlled by Suharto, this ruthless dictator. And, uh, and it was being funded by the World Bank and by the UK government and by the US government, of course, because all they could see this uh, as as being was just an asset in the cold war mm. he 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 he's our asset so we're going to fund whatever he wants and the real epicenter of this was this illegally occupied territory west papua which is the western half of of, of new guinea and it's like it's the same status as as um the uh, occupied territories in the middle east or, uh, or or tibet for example uh, and yet nobody talks about it it's right. just sort of completely off the, the, the political radar. And, and there is and was a genocide going on there. Basically, you know, the, the, the governor of West Papua at the time that we, we, we were, me and the photographer, um, I, I um, fooled into going with me. Um, the time we went out there, the governor said, we're trying to create a beautiful new race of people with pale skin and straight hair because the West Papuans had, had cur curly hair and dark skin. And, and it was like, you know, th this is genocide. It was yeah. Straightforward genocide was taking place. And so um, we, uh, would, we wanted to get to West Papua. And we weren't allowed to. Um, and I, we, we spent a couple of weeks in Jakarta, desperately trying to get a permit to go there, pretending to be missionaries, bird watchers, 
changed every day. It didn't, probably didn't help that it changed every day. <laughs> um, and then one day I was walking down this corridor in the, the police headquarters in, 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 in Jakarta after another incredibly frustrating day, just queuing and getting nowhere. I went down to see if I could find a glass of water and halfway down the corridor was this door, which was ajar, and it said head of immigration police on the door. I said, I'm going to go in and use everything I learned at Oxford to persuade this young man <laughs> that I am entitled to go to West Papua. So I knocked on the door, no answer. I pushed the door open and there was no one there. But on the desk was a pad of headed note paper <laughs> and a stamp. So I thought, who needs the head of immigration, please? <laughs> so we wrote ourselves this permit and <laughs> on the back of it spent six months uncovering this unbloody believable stuff going on in West Papua. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we very nearly got killed several times. It was insane. But we came back with this very, very powerful story. And for some reason, the Suharto government objected to the means by which we had found our way to West Papua. <laughs> yeah. And so in, in life in prison, if you go back there, will you get be sent to prison or are you all right now? I've chosen not to test the proposition. <laughs> okay. It's a shame Indonesia is nice, you know, it's nice way to go on holiday, you're not going to be able to do that. But on that, and yeah, you give me a new emergency question that might not work for anyone else, but I think this was on the Indonesian. Have you ever been stung into a poisonous coma by hornets? It's amazing you should yeah, ask that. It's, good. it's, good. it's a good question. So I'm going to so, ask everyone that from now on, because <laughs> this is going to be a great start to this question. <laughs> So, so there was one day when, when we'd been trying to connect with this rebel movement, um, um, the, the, the Free West Papua movement, which was literally armed with bows and arrows against helicopter gunships. You know, it was... You talk about inequality of arms. It, it was insane. But anyway, and we'd been waiting and waiting. They were meant to send someone to meet us and then we'd go out in a boat and we'd go to the headquarters and it was all very exciting, but it just wasn't happening. And so every day I tried to do something... To, get, to just get my mind off the boredom of sitting in this fly-blown little town in the north of West Papua trying to connect with these people. And, and, and I, uh, one day I took this minibus to the end of the road, and I say the road, it was the road, there was only <laughs> one road, and it ended about five, five miles away from this town. And, and so I got to the end of the road and I went for a walk through the forest. And, and it was a hot day and I took my shirt off and I was walking and I was sweating a bit. And I bumped into, it had been some burning in the forest. Someone had done a bit of Sweden agriculture, a sort of slash and burn. I bumped into this tree stump, walked on a couple of paces, and suddenly I was covered in hornets. And, and these aren't your, your pathetic little hornets that we get in, in Britain. These are these jungle, black jungle hornets, which you know, uh, we'd read in our, in our SAS survival handbook, which turned out to be not an entirely reliable guide to... Um, um, to, to, to surviving in West Pap, where the, um, three of, th stings from three of these could, could kill you. Right. And I was completely covered in it. And they were all over my bare skin. They were tangled up in my hair, buzzing away. And, and I knew you've just got to stay completely still, pretend to be a tree, and eventually they'll lose interest and fly away. But there was this one coming up. My, I was wearing shorts, and it was just coming up my inside leg. And I... I so, and for about 10 seconds, I held on. I was like, no, 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 no. I will not be, I will not be d disconcerted by a hornet going up my inside leg. And then suddenly I just couldn't hack it. And I started thrashing at them with my shirt and running and shouting and trying to get them off. And I got stung all over. Well, right. I could count eight, you know, each one was like a hammer. It's like, boof, this really massive blow. It's a, because... They just pack this huge, like, poison punch. And, and so I went running through this forest, shouting, ah, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And I come to this house on stilts, um, because there they, they built houses about 10, 12 foot off the ground to get out, out of the way of the mosquitoes. And, um, and it was obviously the house of the farmer whose, whose cultivation had, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been crossing. And... And, and I stood at the bottom of this ladder and shouted, help, 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 I'm, I'm, I've, I've been attacked by insects. I didn't know, know the, the, the name for hornets, a uh, word for hornets. I've been attacked by insects and eight of them have bitten me and I'm going to die. I need your help. 
and no, not a squeak from the house. So I climb up the ladder and, and there in, in this little room is an entire family looking absolutely terrified, with like eyes, it's like saucers, just like, what the hell? And, and, you know, and I realised there I was sort of bare-chested with hair sticking up on <laughs> end and sweating and frothing and... Uh, and, and so I said, no, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. I'm George, it's fine. <laughs> and, I, and I stepped forward, I bumped my head on the lintel and fell on top of the mother of the, this <laughs> family. And there was a oh. so, so I stood up and said, right, right, you've got, you got to hear me. This is very important. I, I, was, I was walking through the forest. I got attacked by insects. Eight of them had bitten me and now I'm going to die. And, and this young woman just started going, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, so I repeat it and finally this, this, the, the, the father of the family goes ah saranga and I say yes oh shit instead of saranga which means insects I've been saying samanka which is watermelons <laughs> <laughs> so which wasn't a great start no. And so, um, and so he said, ah, right, you, you come through here and lie down. I've got just the thing. And I thought, ah, oh, there's going to be some amazing jungle medicine, you know, developed o over millennia <laughs> to, to cure hornet stings. So, so I lie down and, and, and he starts rubbing this stuff into my back and it feels great. It's all warming and relaxing and lovely. And it's like, ah, oh, so, so nice. And then uh, there's this familiar smell. And I turn around, and he's got this jar of Vicks vapor rubbers. <laughs> <laughs> I go, no, no, I'm gonna die. And so I run out the house, <laughs> forgetting that it's 10 foot off the ground. <laughs> Keep running like in a cartoon and hit the ground, and I'm still running, and I'm just oh, like this. And I'm running across the fields. And I turn around, and there he is with his jar of Vicks vapor rub in one hand and my shirt in the other hand, going, Jesus, these English are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you survived. I, I got back to. I, oh, I yeah. got another minibus back to the town. Um, as I arrived, I started having these poison convulsions. But I got back to the hotel where my friend was staying and just was sparked out for sixteen hours. But well, then, yeah. then I was all right. So it wasn't. You weren't even doing any investigation or anything. You were just having you were out having to walk in the forest. <laughs> Pure humiliation. It'd be a, ter a, bit a like terrible evening. way to die, wouldn't it? Yep. That would <laughs> yeah. Just to lose <laughs> yeah, the, the start of your career. No one would have even known. No I mean, one, you've, no you've, you've, you've taken it. a lot of you took a lot of risks, generally speaking, and you've, there's been other times you've practically been dead. When you, you've been, I, 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 I was technically I was, dead. I was, I was technically dead. I was pronounced yeah. clinically dead um, in Lodwa General Hospital in Turkana District in in Kenya, in the northwest of Kenya. Um, it, it was was a misdiagnosis, but, right. <laughs> but the, um, uh, I'd, I'd contracted cerebral malaria, and um, and uh, it was this extraordinary thing. I was I, we were staying with um, uh, living with this group of Turkana nomads in 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 northwestern Kenya, and and they said you've got to go and visit the fortune teller. And we said, oh, fortune teller, all right then. Yeah, we visit. I mean, it'd be interesting. We go and visit the yeah. fortune teller, and this guy lived in a hut all by himself outside the village and he was a grumpy old bastard who just sat in this hut um waiting for people to come to him and um and and he he looks up and he's like oh it's them you know <laughs> you, you can see it's just like so wait, wait a minute you know, these two these these two white guys have just suddenly turned up at your hut you're not remotely phased well of course not he's a fortune teller <laughs> <laughs> so so he um so and he says um he says you've come to have your fortune told haven't you <laughs> How do you know? It's good. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so he gets his cow hide out. And the idea is you throw down a couple of hide sandals. And according to how they land, you can then tell something about, about the, the person you're throwing it down on their behalf. And um, so, so my friend Adrian, the same um, poor sod I went with to, to West <laughs> Papua, he had his done first. And, the, and they both landed right way up in a particular configuration. The guy says, well... Well, not much going on in your life then. So what, apart from the fact that I'm in Turkana district. So he does mine and he says, Whoa, oh, wow, you are seriously ill. And I said, oh, fine, I'm totally fine. He said, you, 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 
you are very close to death. And I said, but look, I, I'm completely fine. There's nothing wrong with me. He said, that's what you say. <laughs> and so I thought, well, well, okay, well, thanks, great, nice to meet you. So, and it happened that day, we had to go back to the regional capital, Lodwar, and Adrian had to go off down to Nairobi. Um, and I was just going to stay there for a few days doing a bit of, bit of research before we came back up and we went off to this cattle camp. And um, as soon as we got to Lodwar and Adrian had gone, I suddenly started feeling really weird. <laughs> and then everything was coming out at both ends and I collapsed. Uh, and then I tried crawling out into the street and I blacked out. And it happened that I blacked out literally across the road from Lodwar General Hospital, which was the only hospital for about 600 miles. <laughs> and, and I woke up two days later staring into this guy's face as his eyes were literally clouding over and he died right in front. It was the first thing I saw when I woke up was this guy dying in front because our beds had been pushed together because right. there was so little room. And, and then the doctor comes around and said, oh, you're meant to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, I think that was him. No, 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 you're down on the list as dead. <laughs> so yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the fortune teller gave you the disease somehow off the shoe maybe you had the, you had the poison shoe yeah he, he has he has to make sure he makes sure <laughs> yeah. make sure it all comes right it's not usual for a fortune teller go Africa. yeah you're about to die that's not good for business <laughs> no. yeah you're about to die mate good though yeah. blimey yeah, yeah. Mm. i mean not for you so no. much but that took a long time to i mean you've, you know you've, that took a long time to get right from though obviously that was yeah no it really it it, it completely oh, this was cerebral malaria so yeah. it really plays with your head and so I went completely schizophrenic for about four or five days. I mean, hearing voices, seeing things. I, I, I experienced a full-on earthquake. Right. All the tiles sliding off the roof, people screaming, running around, dogs barking. I stumble outside, earthquake, earthquake! And there's a night watchman asleep on the stoop, <laughs> and the roof's made of corrugated iron. Right. Right. So, how, how, what, what was going on? It was just, it was so strange. We were driving down the road and... Stop! And there was this procession of elephants right by the bonnet. I say, God, that was close. And Adrian say, What was close? So, what do you mean, what's close? <laughs> look, look, elephants. And there aren't any elephants. Wow, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Yeah. I can see every hair on the on, on their skin. It was amazing. Cool. Mm. I might get terrible. The fact that they were woolly mammoths might have might have yeah, given it have away. Given away. <laughs> yeah. Is it worth getting just for the hallucinations, or is it? No. And it's not taking drugs, is it? <laughs> so it's, it's legal. <laughs> but yeah, you, but also you've you know you've been a, you've been a, a, you've had your foot broken by security guards. Salisbury Hill was that? Yeah. So this was on a Rhodes protest in 1994, and a bunch. So so the the Tory government at the time had come up with this fantastic wheeze of connecting all the dots between scheduled ancient monuments and nature reserves and sites of special scientific interest across the whole country with motorways. <laughs> um, and they had this massive motorway building programme. Uh, Thatcher had boasted that it would um, be the biggest road building programme since the Romans and, and nothing can stop the great, great car economy. And we did. We stopped it. You know, <laughs> but... but at a cost of, of quite a lot of, of, of blood and treasure. Yeah. And, and uh, we were just routinely beaten up by these licensed thugs in yellow tabards, these, these security guards, under, inside of the police. The police would just stand there and watch as these guys just beat the crap out of us. And, and in this particular case, we'd been trying to do what we call digger diving, which was to climb onto bulldozers to stop them from working. And um, these two monstrous blokes grabbed hold of me and later found out that one of them had a GBH conviction. And so, oh, yeah, you, you'll be great for a security guard. So um, <laughs> they, they, they grabbed me, dragged me across um, the, the site where they were building the road. And there was this whole pile of fencing material which had these spikes on, on, on top of it, which they were about to erect. And they just threw me on top of this pile. And one spike just went and missed my neck by literally a couple of millimetres. Um, and I thought, blimey, that was close. And then I tried to leave myself up, and it's like, I was stuck. I was completely stuck. And then I noticed that there's this spike going through my boot and out the other side. I thought, oh, that's why I'm stuck. So I go, <laughs> and it goes, <laughs> and suddenly there's this fountain of blood coming out through the hole in the top of my boot. 
I thought, oh, that doesn't look very nice, I think. And so I tried to stand up, and I, I just fall, fall, fall flat on my face because the middle bone had been completely smashed. Right. Um, the x-ray was spectacular. There was <laughs> shards of bone all, all over the foot. So, um, so they, they said, and, and, and you know, when the doctors saw it, they thought, oh, you know, you might never walk properly again. Um, they, they always say this, just so you don't get disappointed. But... Um, <laughs> But they, they managed to stick it all together, and um, and and I, I got it all mended, and 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 I was in this massive great cast and with crutches, and I thought, right, you know, if I can never walk properly again, what 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 will I not be able to do? And so I made a sort of point of bouncing around on crutches to say, look, I can I can really, you know, I'll be fine, I'll be fine because I can still move move a lot on crutches. So I went round to a friend's house, and 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 I and they said, oh God, how are you doing? Oh great, look, watch, and I go boing boing across <laughs> their floor hit their rug. The rug just goes, I go straight out through the French doors <laughs> and they heard this fantastic crashing of flower pots <laughs> off stage. They said, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> you're sort of like the Mr. Bean of uh, <laughs> investigative journalism. <laughs> but you get some reasons. So you, you, you were successful. That was worth, was it worth losing your... The mobility of your foot for a while. Yeah, like actually, that. I mean, it, it healed fine. But um, yeah, I mean, we we won. I mean, we yeah. lost we lost some of the battles, but we won the war. We stopped that huge road building program from happening, and so we still got a few scheduled ancient monuments right. and nature yeah. reserves left in this country. It's incredible. I mean, it's it is sort of incredible when you we find out the facts about this stuff. I guess it's you know, it's there's so much stuff going on in the world. It's hard for people to cover everything. But if they if it's in their interest not to cover, they're not going to cover those stories. So it's, yeah. it's sort of... I found that you did a TED talk and I think several things about rewilding and about uh, the wolves going back into the part... Was it... Uh, in, into Yellowstone, Yellowstone. Yeah, I yeah. think they call it Jellystone Park. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to check that I didn't get the wrong one. That's where Yogi Bear came from. Um, <laughs> so they introduced wolves back into the in Yellowstone Park and that kind of completely changed the yeah. whole environment in a way you wouldn't expect. Yeah, so, so when I studied zoology here yeah when you could actually watch the saber-toothed tigers um they the the story we were told was basically that ecosystems are controlled from the bottom up that you have a particular soil type particular weather then you have particular kinds of plants and that um supports particular herbivores which supports particular carnivores but it turns out that we believe that that was universal because we basically wiped all the big predators out almost everywhere but yeah. when you bring them back in some cases, at least, you see these extraordinary effects where the predators control the herbivores, which control the vegetation, which controls the soil type. And the whole thing actually starts at the top of the food chain, not at the bottom. It's called a trophic cascade. Mm. Trophic to do with feeding, cascade, well, you know what one of them is. Um, and, and, and this was one of the spectacular examples where, according to, to a, a one paper, the wolves had such a powerful impact when they were reintroduced to Yellowstone that they even changed the shape of the rivers because the, um, by driving the deer out of places where they could easily be trapped, like the river valleys, um, they enabled the trees to, to, to grow back, which then stabilised the banks of the rivers, changed their meander pattern, and so the actual physical fabric of the land was yeah. changed by a couple of packs of wolves in this vast area. It's, I mean, it's incredible. So what, what's the, the message from that? I mean, it's basically that we... I mean, wouldn't the world be better if the humans all do kill themselves and we are wiped out and then we, everyone can get back to... Well, we, we, we're doing our best. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> Problem is we're uh, taking give quite us a lot credit. of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the trouble... Uh, well, not the trouble is, but, you know, we are a phenomenally resilient species. So yeah. it will basically be us, rats, cockroaches, and tardigrades. That's about <laughs> it. Um, and what some of, some of us are trying to do is to say, maybe we could change course before we get to that point, yeah. and maybe we could have humans and other wildlife as well. Wouldn't that be quite nice? Yeah. Um, though that seems, uh, in most circles, to be too much to ask for. It turns you into an enemy of society. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to know, you know, I mean, I hope that the stuff you're doing <laughs> saves humanity and the world, but it's difficult to, you know, to know. It, it feels like, is that part of the problem? It feels like it's so in progress and it's so going to be so hard to stop this 
runaway juggernaut that we're, we're not going to be able to do it? Well, you know, it does. everything we're fighting is things that we ourselves have created. I mean, there are so many better ways of running an economy, which are much more distributive, much more fair, and don't actually trash the entire basis of life on Earth, which the economy is just a small part of. There are so many better ways of, of running societies where everybody has much more of a say than we do at the moment. Um, we, you know, we created the dysfunctional systems. We can create different systems. But that does mean confronting those who have been empowered by the dysfunctional systems, who are the billionaires and the people who work for those billionaires, basically. And that, that, those are the people whose power we have to overthrow. But it's, at the moment, again, as we record this... Uh, we may be coming up to a general election probably quite soon, but you know, just in spite of everything that's happened the last ten years in this country, in the United Kingdom, and everything the, the Conservative Party have done, it seems to be that they're going to get, you know, and anything can happen, obviously, and we know that. But it seems to be that they're going to get voted in again, in spite of all this. And obviously, you know, I think I think just the first place, sort of some kind of massive electoral reform is required in the yeah. UK to get us out of the mess we're in, but it doesn't seem like the public are voting for that. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the whole thing has been pitched as, as, as A, we're going to get sovereignty from Brexit, and B, that sovereignty is going to be popular sovereignty as opposed to parliamentary sovereignty, you know, because it's, it's all people versus parliament. That's mm. Boris Johnson's whole pitch. And yet, we're not given any popular sovereignty at all, except an election every four or five years, and a referendum every few decades. Now, you know, that, that is basically an 18th century style of, of government, where it, it's a purely representative system. In other words, entirely based on parliamentary sovereignty. And yet all the talk is of popular sovereignty, and we don't have any at all. And today we've got so many tools for running things better. Citizens' assemblies and... and, um, and participatory budgeting and, um, and, and these amazing digital means of changing the face of cities, like in, in, in Reykjavik, where everybody decides the future of the city through, you know, through, through this incredibly interesting new voting system that they've created using digital tools. Yeah. But our political system is still in the age of the quill pen. It's extraordinary. Yeah. You know, it's all black rods and sergeants at arms. It's basically this sort of cod medieval pantomime well, we, what we ought to have is a political system where we retain power between elections rather than just having a say once every four or five years. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> I mean, it, it really does feel... I mean, we were talking backstage about the Oxford Union and the way those people have gone on to become the actual parliament, but it's all the, same, it's all the arguments the same, the way it's put together. It's same. It feels so archaic. Um, just, you know, it, you watch it and you're embarrassed by... I mean, I just watch it as a comedian and be embarrassed by the, the jokes that pass for jokes in Parliament for a start. <laughs> I'd like to see Parliament wiped out just for that. Uh, but, you know, just if... It, does something massive have to happen in order to change that? Or can we, well, can we change that in five years or ten years or are we looking 50 years down the line and too late? Well, when, when you look at the incredible power of movements for democratic reform in the past where everybody said it's impossible votes for women you've got to be kidding you know i mean it was just it was a far more preposterous proposition uh, as seen by people then a lot of people huge numbers of people than having a a participatory democracy is is today people say oh well, that might be interesting there might be some drawbacks to it but votes for women no way yeah. It, those women ever going to have you might as well might as well give your pet rabbit a vote you know this this was the level of the rhetoric yeah. and yet it happened and it happened incredibly fast once the suffragettes mobilized on a sufficient scale um the same same with civil rights you know the same with the end of the apartheid regime the same with decolonization of india it's all impossible until it happens sure and so what can we do as citizens to help that occur if we wanted well, to. Well, so, so this is a model that Extinction Rebellion has been trying to develop. How do we produce the most effective form of non-violent civil disobedience? Because basically there's been no genuine progress ever without non-violent civil disobedience. That's how things change. And they haven't quite got there yet, but I'd say they're halfway there. You know, they, they've, I mean, they've managed to take a totally neglected but humongous issue and take it from the outer darkness into the centre of political life, which is 
a start. Yeah. But we, you know, we've got to refine that model. And, and we've got to be very clear about what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it. So, for instance, if you look at the Remain campaign at the moment, it's, it's massive rallies, million people on the streets and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's really hard to see where that's going to go because just getting people on the street for one day doesn't actually seem to change anything at all. Think of the, the, the anti-Iraq war demo. I mean, that is not enough. That doesn't, doesn't do it. You, you've got to have a very clear strategic program about the positive thing you're trying to achieve. I mean, the problem that Remain has got is just trying to reverse something. So it's, it's quite a negative campaign. You need to have a very clear positive propositional program. Here is the politics we would like to see. And you can't base that around just one narrow thing about trying to create, a one sort of trying to reverse something you don't like. Mm. You've got to be far more radical than that if you're going to create some, some sort of systemic change. So the combination of having that clear program, very clear demands, recognizing that those demands aren't going to be given to you, you've basically got to force a political situation where the system changes, and having sustained and massive non-violent direct action, that's how stuff changes. Yeah. And do you feel like, is Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister sort of the death throes of that old system? It just feels like he's the worst. I mean, obviously Trump as well. It just feels like the worst people. Having known, I didn't know him personally, but I knew people like him. And you could tell from people who know him that he's, he's not interested in anything but himself. Maybe not even that. I mean, I don't even know what motivates it. If you'd troll the whole country looking for the worst possible person yeah. to be Prime Minister, I don't think you could have done better. I mean, I think the double whammy of, of Johnson and, and Trump is pretty impressive. Yeah. If we could go back 10 years and tell people that that was coming, yeah. we'd, we'd, I don't think we'd get many takers for it. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, well, it's uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> I'm doing podcasts, so I can't really do much uh, to help you. Can't, I haven't even asked if he's tried to suck his own cock. And I, guess, so I, don't know if there's, I don't know if there's time. The real important questions. Um, well, it's, it's really fascinating. It's definitely worth uh, looking up that TED Talk and, uh, and you know, obviously write for The Guardian and uh, cover a lot of these subjects on your uh, website. So Extinction Rebellion, there's pro is there a website for that? There's got to no, be. No, there's, an ex there's yeah. a website for everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so uh, well, if, if that's interested, you do uh, look up that. It's, it's May. We probably got 50 or 60 years before we think about whether we have to get involved. <laughs> that's what I'm taking from the interview. <laughs> Just uh, relax a little bit first. Go and run in the jungle and get stoned by some bees first. Um, no, look, it's been amazing to, ha to have this fantastic talk with you. And well, it's really great good, to have the chance to cheer everyone up. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Wait till next week's show. It's going to be really <laughs> depressing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing George Mambio. Thank you. See you next week. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>